third part of micro-level evidence, excuse me. So what about the peacefulness of people, right? So we learned about the productivity of crops, the productivity of people. What about the peacefulness? Okay, so um, just so you know that I'm not making this question up, um, I appeal to the bard, in this case, Shakespeare. So people have been considering this relationship between hot temperatures and, and, and humans' uh, propensity to, to violence or, or to not playing well with one another for a long time, right? So here's Romeo and Juliet. Um, here's Benvolio talking to Mercutio. Again, these are sort of uh, the good guys. These are Romeo's friends, right? Um, what they're saying here, I pray thee, good Mercutio, let's retire. The day is hot. The Capulets, the bad guys, if you haven't seen Romeo and Juliet in a while, the Capulets are abroad. And if we meet, we shall not escape a brawl, for now these hot days is the mad blood stirring, right? So he's saying there's just something about it being hot that makes us sort of angry and mad and, and wanting to fight, right? Um, so we know where this goes, right? It ends badly. They stay out on the street, and then Tybalt kills Mercutio, and then Romeo kills Tybalt, and, and the rest is sort of tragedy, right? So, so to Shakespeare, this ends really badly. Um, so it turns out there's actually dozens of academic studies now uh, that, that look at this relationship between the climate system, so in this case temperature, uh, and a range of conflict outcomes that we might care about. Anything from sort of uh, street murders, which would be the case in, 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 in Romeo and Juliet here, all the way up to uh, civil wars in sub-Saharan Africa. But we looked at this and found there was no sort of systematic effort to look at these studies as a whole and try to understand what are they telling us sort of systematically about the relationship between changes in climate uh, and, these, and this range of, of conflict outcomes that we care about. So that's what we wanted to do. Um, so I'm going to give you a few examples of what these studies look like uh, and, then, and then give you sort of the, the, the take-home answer, which was our sort of synthesis of all of these studies. So we submitted them to a formal meta-analysis, if you guys have heard that term, where you, where you combine the effects across studies to try to build, a, build sort of an average picture of what they're telling you. But first, some individual studies. So here's some early experimental evidence. So it turns out psychologists have been at this for a while, putting people in rooms and, and torturing them uh, and, and seeing what happens. Um, so they do this both actually sort of, uh, you know, in, in rooms or in the basement of, of Stanford somewhere, but they also do it sort of out in the field. So here's sort of a funny one that we found. So this is uh, some psychologists studying a road rage in Arizona. So what they did was that the researcher uh, would be sitting in his, you know, this is the 80s, right? So um, 80s, Phoenix during the summer, right? Really hot out. So the researcher uh, is sitting in his car in a parking lot, right? Uh, he's close to a, a, a stoplight, uh, and he's looking down the road and seeing, uh, watching for cars to come, right? And as soon as he sees a car coming, he pulls out of the parking lot and stops at the stoplight, right? And he waits. And then the stoplight turns green, and he waits again, right? But he starts his watch. And then he starts, stops his watch when the guy behind him starts honking, right? <laughs> and so what you find, I mean, it's sort of cute, right? Uh, Road rage, or the propensity to just really be on your horn when it's hot, uh, spikes dramatically the hotter it is out, right? Okay, so this is arguably not a type of conflict we're going to be that worried about with climate change. Um, here's one a little closer to home. So some Dutch psychologists did this police training experiment where um, they, they put uh, police recruits in a room, uh, and they sort of altered the temperature in the room while these guys were, were doing these, these simulation exercises, these training exercises, which... Um, I imagine them to be like, you know, the bad guy pops up or the good guy pops up and you have to decide like who to shoot or whether to shoot or something. And what they find is that the, these recruits are much more likely to shoot at a simulated intruder uh, when it's really hot out, right? Um, something like twice as likely. And then when they were interviewed afterwards, they were way more likely to, to feel that they had been threatened uh, and should have responded aggressively uh, in the room where it was really hot, right? So again, some experimental evidence that we respond differently when it's hot out and, and respond more aggressively. Okay, so these again are, are cute sort of small scale examples, but it turns out this pattern shows up in sort of larger scale outcomes that we care about. So here are six different examples. So our, our, uh, our study actually goes through 60 of them. I won't bore you with all 60. Mm -hmm. But here's six sort of representative examples. So focus on two, the two and sort of the top left for starters, right? This is the relationship between um, average temperature, or actually the, the, the hot temperature, maximum temperature, uh, in U.S. counties, uh, and aggravated assault and rape in U.S. counties. And what you see, and we have tons of data in the U.S., so we can look at this very carefully and, and estimate this very precisely, you see 
this strong upward sloping relationship, again, between really hot temperatures and these, and these different measures of violent crime, right? So this is in the top. So this is uh, these two right here. So this is the violent crime. Sorry, these, uh, the, the text here is really small. The, tupper, the upper left here is violent crime, uh, and uh, the sort of middle top panel there is, is rape. Um, okay, so bad news there, right? Um, the rest of them are larger scale conflicts. So focus on this one in the upper, upper right now. This is civil wars in sub-Saharan Africa. So this is actually from a paper we had about five years ago in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences um, that showed uh, if you use country level data over the last four decades in sub-Saharan Africa, you also see this very strong upward sloping relationship between hotter than average temperatures and more civil wars. So these are the sort of iconic civil wars that we think about that we, you know, that we see on the news, right? The, the really bad ones. Um, okay, and the bottom three panels are, are, are sort of more of the same. Uh, on the far left there um, uh, are, are sort of smaller scale violence. So this is uh, intergroup violence in East Africa. There's things like, uh, like cattle raids. Um, we can drill down to Kenya. We see something similar. And this last one, uh, so the bottom right, is, is political leader exit. So this is sort of the overturning of governments. And again, in all of these cases, we see this strong upward sloping relationship between hotter than average temperatures and an increased likelihood of these things happening. Um, these bad things happening, I think I can say. Um, OK, so, so Shakespeare was right, it turns out. <laughs> so reanalyzing uh, sort of 25 of the best studies for which we could get the most detailed data, uh, we find that uh, for a one standard deviation increase in, in temperature, and I'll come back to that in a second, for one standard deviation increase in temperature, we see a 10% increase in these sort of group level conflicts. These are things like civil wars. Uh, and a 2% increase in individual level conflict. This is things like aggravated assault and murder. Okay, so people aren't, I, I think at least a lot of people aren't used to thinking in terms of standard deviation. So what's a standard deviation? So in the tropics, so at places like Nigeria, again, the temperature doesn't move around that much. So a standard deviation is like half a degree. Uh, a historical standard deviation of temperature is like half a degree. So this says a half a degree increase in temperature is associated with a 10% increase in group level conflict, right? So now let's run the world forward. Remember what those climate projections said, right? A two degree, three degree, four degree Celsius increase, right? That's like six standard deviations or seven standard deviations, right? We're starting to get up into a, lot, a, a very large increase in standard deviation terms, right? So multiply six or seven by this number and you start to get some, some pretty large numbers, right? Uh, in the US, the standard deviation of temperature is a little larger, right? Temperatures move around a lot. Um, so a standard deviation in the U.S. is something like two degrees Celsius. So, so that would sort of imply a smaller increase uh, in the U.S. Um, okay, and so this bottom plot uh, is sort of funny. So I'm I'm trained as an economist, and you know, econ <laughs> economists never make themselves very popular. But they'll say, yeah, you know, we're going to have all this conflict. It's going to kill people. But look what it's going to do to the economy, right? Look what it's going to do to the economy. So. <laughs> So conflicts, it turns out, are also a ma major source of lost economic opportunity. This is probably less important than the people who get killed in the conflicts, but it also hurts GDP. So here's a plot of, uh, this is a historical plot of sort of what happened during four major civil wars in different countries um, around the world. And, and the shaded area is sort of right when the civil war happened. Uh, and the lines sort of give you uh, what was happening to uh, incomes before the civil war. Uh, and then you can see sort of what happened afterwards. So the solid line is the trajectory of income that, that we observed after this war happened. So not only do these things kill people, but, but they're bad for the economy. Okay, so reconciling micro and macro. Sorry, I'm, I'm fighting a cold here, so I hope I don't lose my voice. Um, Reconciling micro and macro. So what I just showed you was a bunch of, if you will, micro level evidence. So evidence from sort of small scale studies around the world. So how does this inform sort of the first slide I put up, which were these macro level estimates, these global estimates of, of basically how much we should care, right? How much is this going to affect global economic productivity? Um, so again, in those suggested, uh, at least from that IPCC plot, a very small sort of response, right? But this seems inconsistent with all the stuff I just showed you, right? On the micro level, we see these what look like pretty negative responses all around the world, both again for, for plants, for sort of people's productivity more broadly and for these conflict outcomes that we care about, right? So how can we reconcile these things? So what we do, and this is work uh, with co-authors at Berkeley, Saul Shang and Ted Miguel, um, we're going to replicate the same sort of micro-study design, the one I, I motivated with the Norway and Nigeria example. 
we're going to do that at the macro level. So we're going to use country level data, the sort of best and longest country level data we can find. So we use over 50 years of, of country level data on growth, uh, economic growth basically, growth in per capita GDP. Uh, and we have this for over 150 countries uh, around the world. So a bunch of data from around the world. Um, and so what we can do again is using all this data, we can compare um, the US uh, in a hot year to the US in a normal year. We can compare Nigeria in a hot year to Nigeria in a normal year. And we can do that for every single country in the world. And this allows us to build a picture of, of how, of how uh, country level and thus global sort of aggregate GDP responds to changes in temperature. Okay, so what does that look like? So here's the historical plot, and let me walk you through this. It's sort of busy. On the y-axis there, um, on the uh, vertical axis, is, uh, again, the outcome measure that we care about, the annual growth uh, in GDP per capita. So just think about this as, as income. Uh, and on the x-axis, again, on the horizontal axis, is annual average temperature. So again, this is aggregated up to the country level, right? All we see is sort of annual averages. That's the best we can do in these data. And then this, this hill-shaped thing is, is the response that we estimate, the relationship between these two things. Uh, and the first thing to take home is that it is hill-shaped. So the sort of dark line is sort of our best estimate, and the blue thing around it is the confidence interval, sort of the uncertainty around the estimate. Um, so it's hill-shaped, and it's hill-shaped in a very sort of interesting and important way. So these vertical lines, and again, sorry, I apologize that the text is sort of small here. Each of these vertical lines, if you can see them, shows you the average temperature of different sort of large economies or large countries around the world. So if you can read these, uh, the ones on the left you see here, so this is Germany, UK, and France. This is uh, Northern Europe, right? Norway would be even to the left of those. These countries uh, are pretty cool, right? Um, sort of cooler average temperatures, you know, maybe around 10 degrees Celsius. So what our data would suggest is that these countries actually do a little bit better when it's, when it's a little bit warmer out. If temperatures go up one or two degrees Celsius, these guys actually grow a little bit faster. Um, the US, Japan, China, it turns out, are sort of right at the top of the curve here. Um, so what the data would suggest then is, is as you warm them up, you move down the curve a little bit, and these guys are hurt eh, just a little bit, right? And now go out to the tropics, right? We know the tropics are hot to begin with, so look at Brazil, look at Indonesia, India, Nigeria. These guys are really hot to start with, and they're on sort of the the downward slope of this thing and the steep sort of downward slope the further you move out. So again, that's these guys out here, tropical countries, we're on the downward slope of this response function, right? So again, the response function is telling us how per capita uh, incomes change as, as temperature changes, right? And so what this tells us then is that for these hot countries, these countries that are already hot, any additional increase in temperature is gonna make these guys a lot worse off, right? So here's this in terms of a map. So this is a map. Um, that, that comes right out of this thing I just showed you, the, the sort of hill-shaped thing I just showed you. So this, this maps the effect of a one degree Celsius increase on GDP growth, right? And the colors, uh, as, as usual in these things, red is bad and blue is good, right? Uh, the, the blue is sort of washed out here. Um, so, you know, the countries in the, in the north where it's cooler, uh, we, we actually project would benefit slightly uh, as, as, it, as it warms up, at least for a few degrees. Uh, and then you can see in the tropics, right, the red guys, these guys are much worse off. Uh, and these are really big effects, right? So these are percentage point effects on growth. So the dark red colors are here are between uh, one and two percentage points loss in growth. So what that means is, let's say Nigeria is growing at 2% uh, a year, right, on average. Um, temperature warms up one degree Celsius. Now they're growing at less than 1% a year, right? So these are huge effects on per capita growth rates. Really, really big effects. Okay, so that's estimated using historical data, right? But we want to know then how big are these effects going to be if we sort of run the world forward under different assumptions of, of how much the climate might change, right? This is sort of the, 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 the policy number that we need. How big is this problem going to be if, if we don't sort of fix the climate problem? How much might incomes change? Okay, so I'm going to show you a little uh, animation here. So on the left here, again, the hill-shaped thing is the historical thing I showed you before, the historical relationship between temperature uh, and per capita growth. Uh, and on the right, I'm going to track the per capita incomes in four different countries, in Germany, in the U.S., in China, and Nigeria. Uh, and the different colors here, so Germany then is going to correspond to this dot, so they're pretty cool to start with. Uh, sort of the U.S. and China are right here, sort of at the top, uh, and then Nigeria is out here, right? And what these plots are going to do is then sort of track out the percentage change in income as we run the world forward. And I'm going to run it 
all the way forward to, to 2100, uh, assuming that uh, the temperatures warm up by about 3 degrees Celsius by 2100. So this is sort of a, a median estimate from the, from the IPCC. Um, okay, so I'm going to start this thing. Here it goes. So you can see the years clicking by here and the temperature going up, right? The countries are slowly moving along. Uh, and you can see what happens, right? Germany's doing a little better off. U.S. is now starting to go down. So is China. And then look at Nigeria, right? Nigeria is, is, is really being hurt. Um, so the growth effects, what this tells you then is these growth effects really compound into large and meaningful effects on per capita GDP. I'm just going to keep going if I don't stop it. <laughs> so let's run it all the way out to the end here. Um, that's sort of fun. You can play with this. Um, Okay, so, so what does this say? So if you take these results literally, right, and this is, again, in a world where we haven't really done much about climate change. We've just sort of continued on a business-as-usual trajectory. Um, what does this say? This says Germany is actually maybe 40 to 50% richer in a world with climate change than it would have been if it had the climate not changed, right? So they're actually better off. U.S. and China, so they were sort of at the peak, right? They were at sort of the optimum temperature historically, and so a little bit of warming actually hurts them. So we project in the U.S. and China uh, losses uh, of income of around 20 to 30 percent. So again, it doesn't mean we're poor. This means we're poor relative to a world uh, where the climate hadn't changed. Uh, and then Nigeria, right? Climate is a, is, a, is a growth disaster for Nigeria, right? Nigeria is way poor, 80 percent poor than it would have been in a world without climate change, right? Um, so a very sort of stark and differential picture uh, sort of around the world, depending on, on where you're looking. Okay, so what does this say then globally? Um, so let's compare our estimates to what I showed you before, sort of the, the older estimates. And, and the way we do this is we just we do that, what I just showed you for each of the countries, and then we add them up across countries, right? And this gives us sort of a global estimate of per capita GDP. Some people are going to be a little bit better off, the Germanys of the world. Most countries are going to be a worse off, some substantially worse off. And so um, think of the global estimate as sort of an average across those countries, right? Okay, so... I had to change the scale on what I showed you before because it turns out our numbers are much more negative than, than what the IPCC suggested. So the, again, the orange dots are what was out of the IPCC, and the blue dots are what we get for different levels of temperature, right? So I had shown you sort of the three-degree level uh, as we go out, not surprisingly, at even hotter temperatures. Um, the effect on global per capita GDP uh, is as high as you know, 30 or 40 percent up at these, these really high levels of warming out here, right? So a very different picture than what the IPCC would suggest. So why are our numbers so different than what the IPCC had? So it turns out it, it's really hard to track down where these numbers come from, right? And there's, there's sort of, uh, we're used to sort of the echo chamber uh, in the political discourse around a lot of questions, right? There's, it turns out there's also sort of an echo chamber in how these <laughs> results are generated and then sort of propagated through scientific studies. So, a bunch of these are based on sort of one-off uh, country-specific estimates from much earlier, uh, decades ago, and that literally have not been updated in years, right? So our, our numbers are much more negative, but they are based on sort of the best data we possibly have and the best sort of statistical tools we have to analyze this data, right? So maybe they're too large, um, but to us, they give us sort of the best, the best picture we know how to create about what might happen if, if we don't sort of mitigate climate change. Okay, so what do we conclude from all this? Again, a bunch of evidence from micro studies, really good evidence, I think very trustworthy evidence, um, that a bunch of outcomes that we care about, plants, people, peace, these things respond negatively to hot temperatures in most parts of the world. Macro level evidence that I just showed you, uh, using a similar research design to these micro level studies, uh, and suggesting a pretty similar response pattern, right? Global economic productivity also declines uh, when it's hot. Okay. So again, what do we conclude? And so what, what's the broader take-home, if you will? Um, the first the sort of global take-home is, you know, if, if, the, if the impacts are really going to be this, this big, um, then I think we care a lot more about climate change than the current sort of IPCC estimates would suggest. And that means we should be willing to invest a lot more in, in, in emissions reductions and in, in reducing climate change uh, than we currently are now, right? That's, that's sort of the, the literal take home from our numbers. But more locally, uh, you know, so, so this is sort of the global policy debate, but we also care about the impacts locally, right? Um, and so for that, I think we really need to understand sort of where and how 
temperature matters. Uh, and again, in Silicon Valley, I think we have a long way to go. We, we actually understand very little about whether sort of productivity in the tech sector uh, responds to changes in climate in, in a way we might care about. So to me, I think this is, a, this is a, an important area of, of future research. And again, if, if any folks in the audience uh, are sitting on a data set that could be used for this purpose and want to collaborate with us, uh, I would be more than excited to talk to you. Um, so that's all I have. I, I look forward to the conversation afterwards and, and to you guys' questions. So thanks.